Welcome to People Love Process. This is going to be our first episode in a new series called Brand Salvage. We all know what a salvage operation is in general. Uh, the dictionary definition explains that, and most of us would think of a shipwreck and the recovery of lost treasure, that type of thing. But the aspect of salvaging I'm focusing on is the rescuing part of salvaging. So if you look at the dictionary definition, you can see rescue shows up in the very first definition um, as well as below. And so that's what I want to focus on. Um, a company can have a horrible brand identity and still provide excellent service or products. Google is a, in the early years of their business is a perfect case in point. The same is true with small business, and they may never have a chance to rebrand to improve their marketing as they grow and develop their business. And that's kind of the, the niche I want to address with this new series. So in this series, I want to approach businesses, both big and small, that are currently using what I would consider poorly designed brand identities and rebrand them as if they were my client rescuing their identity through a visual transformation that can help and improve their marketing efforts. Along the way, I'll also try to pitch my ideas to these entities I focus on and attempt to land them as a client as well. That's always hit or miss. We have a lot to cover, so let's dive right into it. So what is going to be the focus of our very first brand salvage? Well, within collegiate and universities and even schools, you have brand mascots. That's what we're going to focus on. So there's a lot of bad mascots out there. And this is a selection of seven that I found. The top left is the University of Michigan. It's, it's not in terms of a mascot, horrible. It's just not very well refined and kind of cluttered. Like all this detail around this eye just looks like really weird and uh, kind of distracting. So it's more wonky. I wouldn't consider it horrible. I just think it could be um, improved upon. The one to the right of that is based out of the Seattle area, Highline College. You can see they're using Seahawk colors, of course. And it's not horrible either. I just think it could be better defined. I don't like how thin it gets in areas. And so I think that could be improved upon. If we take a look at the next one, that's Kansas Wesleyan University, and it's supposed to be a wolf and it's just really bad, uh, not executed very well and doesn't read very well also. And the next one is a collegiate school in New York. And this mascot was drawn by a parent of one of the students in the 1960s. And uh, this is what they used. And for obvious reasons, I don't think that's well crafted as well. Bottom left is the University of Florida. And this is the mascot they used for many, many years. Now, I'll give them this credit. They've updated it since then. And it does look really good what they're using now. But this is what they use for many years. And uh, that's a pretty big school. The teeth are just like really weird, like just little ticks of black. So uh, there you go. Uh, now, the one in the bottom middle, this is currently being used by the University of Minnesota. And it's a good thing they put a registered R on that because, you know, all kinds of people want to use this. Not. Uh, I thought this was just kind of really poorly rendered. And uh, he just looks constipated and grumpy more than he does anything else. And then the last one is Cornell College. And I almost went with this entity to focus on. Uh, but then I saw another one that you're going to see next, and that's the one I focused on. So uh, let's dive into our specific focus in terms of a specific client, and that's going to be Fordham University. Now, they're based out of the Bronx in New York City, and this just shows uh, some of their brand assets that they currently use. You have a logo type up here. That's pretty straightforward, what you expect from a uh, college or university. This is their uh, brand mascot, a ram. And um, he just looks like he's going, hmm, that's that's what I see, with, especially with his uh, with his mouth. You know, it's like he's 
biting his lip and he's, uh, you know, I, it's just kind of weird. And there's inconsistencies even in their brand graphics. These are part of those. Uh, there's inconsistencies. If you look at their uh, kind of abbreviated design here with the F, their colors are crimson. Uh, they have this darker gray. They have a lighter gray, the crimson and black and white, obviously. But this gray in the usage of the mascot here is light. And then they're using the dark over here. Okay. And then they have these shapes like at the top of the ear and on the top of the eye are these highlights Okay, that makes kind of sense. But as soon as you go to this version, which is just black and white, those highlights are colored black, and especially the top of the ear. And it's just like whoever is doing this just, I don't know, that shouldn't have been handled that way. I just think everything's kind of inconsistent, doesn't go together. And then instead of having this head and then having a body that fits with that head, they have a completely different piece of artwork down here that doesn't even look like the other ones. So that's inconsistent. The only part of their current identity I think was done really well, and it's probably because they went to a service to do this, is their mascot that somebody puts on as a costume. I think this is uh, really great. So I wanna improve their print collateral version and brand graphics and it will go right with this mascot character in the uniform. And we just want to improve upon this. I think we can. So let's just dive into it. All starts with drawing, and it doesn't matter if you prefer drawing in analog or you prefer drawing in digital. You're going to get the same benefit, and you're going to grow your skills by doing either on a consistent basis. And it's going to help you approach projects like this that aren't just merely based off of squares and triangles and rectangles. You actually have to create free form shapes in order, in this case, to pull off a brand uh, character design uh, for a new identity. And it always starts with reference. You want to look at real world reference, in this case, a RAM, uh, to capture the essence of what makes a ram a ram. Well, one of the characteristics I can see here is obviously its horns, but the, the difference between reference and photography um, is key because the photography you use as reference should help guide you in figuring out how to shape and form and deduce those shape and forms into your design. But you don't want to just uh, completely copy a photograph because one, uh, you might get in trouble copyright wise for doing that. Two, uh, photographs are really uh, forgiving. And if you copy it exactly, it might look really weird. So if you look at this one, the horn's awesome. That gives you a good idea of how to shape their horns. It comes to a point, this guy broke his horns off somehow, so you wouldn't want to do it that way. So that's one thing to, to kind of clue you in on is this inside space of the horn kind of frames the ear. We're going to capitalize on that. And then you don't want to pay attention to other detail like this horn wraps around the back and you can see it poking out down here. This isn't the bottom of his chin. It's the bottom of his horn. So you want to pay attention to that. You wouldn't want to uh, embed that into your design. You certainly want to, wouldn't want to have the tip coming here because it looks like a fang coming out of his mouth. Or if you go down here to this one, this horn's poking out right where his nose is. And that could look awkward when you create a graphic based off of that. So you want to create an idealized version using reference to help guide you. This one, you can see, does the same thing. Comes down here and adds this little weird part to the bottom of his chin. So just pay attention to that. Photos should guide you, but you don't want to just replicate exactly how it shows in a photograph because a photograph is forgiving. Nobody's going to look at this and complain that you can see part of his horn. But if you create a graphic that way, it could cause a problem. I wanted to point that out. So this is where the process of drawing happens. Now, drawing is progressive. So you'll want to start out rough. This was my initial rough sketch that I just crudely sketched out really quick just to give Savannah and I the idea of what I'm thinking. I told her we don't want to create a full 
full body, even though they had a full body version, eventually if they wanted to go that way with uh, more assets, if I'm able to sell them on this idea, then yes, we can develop that. But at as this point, as I see it working with their logo type, let's just focus on the bust of the character, the head and its shoulders. And so that's what this sketch uh, does. And I gave it to Savannah and she drew on top of it. She draws digitally. So she did this drawing um, in um, Clip Studio Paint is what she uses. And she uses brushes in there that simulate uh, pencils. So this was her sketch. I thought this was uh, pretty good, but I thought there is some problem areas. The problem areas are this area with the, the ear and the back part is kind of doesn't look right to me. And then having the horn come out over here and the ear showing um, looks a little weird as well. So those are two areas. I think we can improve the shapes and flow on the eye and the brow over the eye as well. So this is where I took this. I redrew this from that just to figure out better how to form and shape things. Um, not so sold on the eye still. I think there's some issues there. This still needs to be worked out. I think it's overcomplicated in this area. We resolve the ear and the horn over here. I think that's working pretty good as is. So it's a process. It's looking at something, and if you have to set it aside and come back to it later, uh, in order to critique yourself, then by all means do it. That's the best way is to art direct yourself. Don't just think good enough. Let's keep moving forward. If something doesn't feel right, then it's usually not right. And you have to figure out why. And over time, the more you do that, the better you're going to get at it. You're going to develop that skill of art directing yourself. So that's all I did here is I figured we need to, to work on this again. So I did another tighter drawing based off of it like this. And if you compare, this is good, but I think this is even better. I resolve the ear and the space here. Uh, but the more I was looking at this, I was thinking, you know, I like how it just kind of creates this kind of zigzag here in the bottom. That's kind of nice action, but I don't like this little part jutting off. So I think we need to refine that. I think we have too many rounding areas in this. I think it needs to get more chiseled to kind of get that... Uh, not to say NFL specifically, but to get that sports graphic kind of feel and flair to it. And so this is where I print this out. And then with uh, translucent stock from Nina, I draw on top of it. And so I'm literally trying to think in shapes here. I know I'm going to build this in vector. So is this exactly the, the size and shape I need for this? And if you look at the horn, this doesn't look bad, but I notice, well, this is getting really thin there. And then it almost gets a little fatter as it gets here. We need to fix that. This is confusing me. I don't know exactly what this is. Part of his neck, but I think we could handle that better. And those are areas I want to improve on. The eye here, I think it could get more chiseled. This is where I draw uh, on top of it on a, a translucent stock. And I chisel these so there's not so much white or not so much roundness going on. Fix the, the thickness of the horn here. And you can see how I revise this area to simplify it. Uh, we still have somewhat of a zigzag, but I simplified it overall. And that's what you're always wanting to do. Simplify it, uh, make it cleaner and meaner. So once we have our refined sketch, I use my flatbed scanner to scan it in, either 600 to 800 PPI, place it in Illustrator. I go to my transparency palette and I just adjust the transparency. We'll do either 20, in this case, I think I'll do 15, and then I'll lock the layer. Now, where's the first place I start? You've watched several of my movies so far on this channel. You should know what I'm going to say, and that is the easiest place to start or the easiest shapes to build. Those are elliptical shapes. So the ones in this design, they're crystal clear that I don't have to use the pin tool is the eyes and the nostril here. So those are easy to discern. What's going to be the hardest shape do you think to create in this design? Well, I think the hardest shape, anytime you have to do somewhat spiral shapes, those can be a little tricky. And Illustrator has a tool called the Curvature Tool. Guess how many times over the years I've used the Curvature Tool to build any shape like this? Well, none. You don't need to. If you understand the principle, if you specifically think like a clock, 
What do I mean by that? Well, if we look at this shape here and I select all the anchor points on uh, this shape, we'll select the bottom here, you can see I have these at uh, specific tangents on most of them. Now, tangents don't apply to every shape you're going to create that has a curve in it. Um, if you're creating a typeface and it's all geometric, then yeah, you'll use tangents. That helps. We have tangents at the top here. We have tangents on the left, tangents on the right, tangents on the bottom here, and the bottom here, and the top here. The only ones that aren't tangents are where it comes to a point, gets a point, these two, and this one isn't a tangent. The tangent would be right about here on this shape, but I like building if my art in this case, the horn is going at an angle, then I find it easier to build at an angle. And then, of course, wherever it terminates and comes to an end, those are easy to discern based off of our drawing. So thinking in shapes, thinking like a clock is going to help you. If you're not sure what I mean, I'm going to turn this layer on. And this is what I call the clockwork method. When I started teaching years ago, um, I was trying to explain this to students and they weren't understanding what I meant about anchor point location. Well, all I meant by anchor point location is figuring out the most ideal places to place your anchor points in order to create the shape you want. And if you think of a clock, this aligns with the clock. 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock. Again, we have the 6 o'clock here. This is a nine o'clock, but it's as if we've rotated our clock to the left and just kind of squashed it a little bit. So it's almost like a trick to help you discern where to place your anchor points. Now, of course, the easiest locations, wherever your art comes to a point, gets a point. These are easy to discern, and so are these ends because you have to start at those ends where those uh, corners come into play here, here, and here. So I just want to explain that. So. Uh, the clockwork method, I put a chapter from my book, Vector Basic Training, uh, on the clockwork method in the resource files for this movie. So you'll get that chapter, and that gives you more extensive um, examples of how to use this methodology to discern anchor point placement when you're building uh, your vector art. But let's go to another aspect, and we're going to zoom in on uh, right here on his head. Um, how would I build, let's say, this shape right here that makes up his chin in the bottom? Well, you could just simply take your anchor, uh, your pen tool that is, start where it starts here, go to this corner, click. We're not even gonna do any kind of um, Bezier curves here. We're just gonna place them where we know there will be anchor points, wherever it comes to a point, gets a point. And then we can go to our um, anchor point tool here. We can grab the path and we can just start finessing these curves afterwards. So if you pull this out, it'll give you access to the handles, then you can adjust it and you can build like this. So I always try to do things the easiest way possible because the easiest way tends to be the cleanest way, tends to be the fastest way, like that. And then if you have to zoom in, never be afraid to zoom in because uh, you never want to leave something perfectly straight. So I think adding a little curve there and a little curve there and that's how I would build a shape like that natively with the pen tool. Now, I also build these shapes. We'll just delete that because I also build these shapes uh, using a plugin as well. And that plugin is called Arch by Points. And it's kind of cool. You start in the same place, wherever it comes to a point, gets a point. You go to the next point, and then you can build your curves as you go along. So I'd start here. And on this, I could go all the way out like that. Click here, go here and put that small curve here. I go up here, click here, go here, build the curve, click this one, click this one, build that curve, and then close out this like that. Switch to the pin tool. I can close that shape like that. So I give myself two ways. Now, 
uh, we didn't even put anchor points in when we built it manually with the pin tool. So whether you have a plugin, whether you have a pin tool, if you think in shapes as you draw, it's going to make the process go so much faster. So if we build the bottom part of his neck here, again, wherever it comes to point gets a point. These are easy. And I have a, a kind of stages. This is what I would call rough build because I don't worry about the curves at this point. You can see this kind of bends this way and bends back this way. So that tells me it's gonna be kind of like a shallow S type of shape. Then I'll go to the anchor point tool. I'll adjust this to get that curve. I'll adjust this to get that curve. This one, it'll start off this way with this handle pulled out here, but on this handle, it'll come back this way. And then we'll go down here, grab this with the anchor point tool, and it'll go that way, reveals this handle, and then we can just finesse these two to get the curve we want, kind of like this. You might have to turn off uh, Smart Guides Command U so it doesn't try to snap to this top path up here, like that. And then we'll just adjust these two curves to get that part of the neck. So it's not hard to build precisely, just think in shape, simplify form, and it's gonna make the process go a lot faster. Now, all of our final base vectors are like this, and once I get to this point of the process, um, I want to kind of create what I call a simple black and white. I always save this stage, so I can always go back to it if I want to. And I usually have a layer called the X layer. I don't have it in this document because I'm presenting the process, and I didn't want to clutter uh, the final result by having that on the top. So. Uh, I would save this um, so I could always go back to my final base vectors. But in this case, we're going to, I want to show you how I go ahead and build out uh, the final black and white art. So on this, I just bring one shape on the top like this. Here is where I'll use a throwaway shape in this case to trim off the part of the eye I don't need. Like that, I can take all these shapes inside the face, including this one, and I can fuse all of those together. When I do that, it's gonna group, so I'm always using a keyboard shortcut of F7 to turn it into a compound. If you don't have keyboard shortcuts turned on, make sure to watch my Creating with Keyboard Shortcuts movie. Uh, if you don't, though, you just have to go to Compound and Make, and this just takes time. This is why I use a keyboard shortcut of F7 to do that. Uh, if I take all these shapes in the, the horns over here and we unite all of those like that, that's good. We'll take all the shapes in the horns, the shape in the ears. We'll create, select these details here, select the horn we already fuse, and we'll unite all those. So we have all those united. Then I can take this shape, which is his nostril, bring it to the front, select this shape minus front to get that detail of the nostril. Then I can select the back, the face elements, the ear and the horns and everything and unite all of those. And now I'll go ahead and fill it black, get rid of the outline. And that's how I create my base black and white. Now I would expand this so that all these shapes on the interior are white and this would be a separate black shape behind it. Uh, that's easy. You would just select it, go to object, go to compound, release. You can, you might have to ungroup it, deselect the background shape. All the, uh, the shapes there in front will become white. You're going to have some shapes like these two, which you'd want to unite. Select the background shape minus front. I would copy this to the clipboard, select all these and paste behind. We have this shape, we'll select this shape. This is basically, let's go ahead and color it so you can see it. We'll punch out of the head shape like that. And so now we have all of our shapes set up. This is the background shape and this is where I'll continue to do refinement and detailing. And so the first kind of refinement I do once I get my base shape is I like to add rounding. Subtle rounding is what I call it. What do I mean by that? Well, 
I'm going to zoom in here and you don't need to use a plugin so you can use the corner widget we could select this but as soon as there's this anchor point in this path if I select this and I round it it won't round past that in this case I don't think that's bad but if you want to get rid of that you're going to have to smart remove this and I have a plugin that I've used for years where I just go over here and I click smart remove and it does that if you don't have that plugin, you can select this anchor point, and if you hold uh, shift down and you click the minus anchor uh, icon up here in the, the tool panel, you click it, it'll smart, oh, well, no, that didn't smart remove it. Let's see, oh, oh, that's right, I forgot that it's an inconsistency i wish it worked that way you can't you have to select the anchor point then you have to go to this tool and then hold shift down and click on this to remove it and then it will remove it i think it's confusing because they have the same icon up here and they should really make it work from this by holding shift down and clicking it so you can smart remove in illustrator that's how you do it once again let's undo that and do it again so it's clear uh, you would select the minus um, pen tool icon, hold the shift key down, click on the anchor that you want to remove, and it will remove it without destroying the tolerance. That way you can go in, select this corner, and you can finesse that curve. So if you want to add a big shadow there under his chin, you can. It wouldn't stop at that one anchor point. So I just wanted to show you that because you will run into that um, as you're building. I might come over here and add some in here. But the area I want to show you is because the way I built it, I built these in shapes. Well, I don't want these to remain in shape, so I would select this and I would finesse it so it just gracefully flows into that angle of my design here to improve the artwork. So that's how I would use rounding in this case uh, to improve the design like that. And I would add rounding wherever it comes to a dagger sharp point, like if we zoom in here on the forehead, I wouldn't want it to come to this sharp of a point. So I go in here and I add really subtle rounds uh, kind of like that. So it, if you're zoomed out, it still looks pretty sharp, but it actually isn't. It has some finesse to it. So this is before I rounded everything, and this is after I rounded everything. So before, after, and I think it looks so much better with all those subtle rounds in it. I also adjusted the beefiness here, and that made me think I need to select this outline, and we need, right now, we just have a black fill, so we're going to add a black outline to it, and I'm going to go to stroke. I'm going to make this three. We'll select a round and I want this to use this one, not this is the one it'll default to. I want it just to go to the outside of that shape. So we're going to use this. And I think that looks so much better having that boldness around everything. So I want to get my artwork to a final uh, base black and white. And that's what I do. That's what this is here for. And um, I want to do this because it's at this point, I'll print this file out. Now I'm working on an eight and a half by 11 horizontal size document here. I just turn off document uh, edges just so it looks cleaner in the videos. But this is where I print it out and I literally draw on top of my printout. And that's all I've done here. And I've taken this, scanned it back in. I usually go to the transparency palette, set this to multiply, set it to around 40 percent just so I can see it and then I lock the layer just like I do when I'm building my base vectors and then I build my uh, shading or shadow areas uh, on top of it based off of my underlying drawing so once I have that built I can turn on uh, my final shading in this respect now the artwork here as I'm looking at it I was going you know I'm not so one, I'm not so sure about the eye. And I, I realized I probably should have gone from this point to this point on the nose. So this is where uh, kind of keeping those things in mind is really important. And so I want to address that. But first, 
I want to utilize the correct brand colors. And these were the brand colors for the college. They had black, they had this crimson, they had a dark blue, and they had a light blue. Now, their crimson was one stage darker. I went one stage lighter because I think it's more rich and works better in all the various print applications. So that's what we're going to be using. So on the final artwork here, I'm going to turn this on. Um, this is where I use the light gray is showing here in the Pantone and the dark gray to create all the shading. Now the crimson's not coming into play here, although um, I will admit I have seen them take the eye and they've color it a crimson in some of their artwork, which I just think looks a little odd. So um, I just kept that a light uh, gray, but I still don't like the shadowing here. So this is where art directing yourself comes in. And I also thought it was a little thin here between the nostril and the edge of the nose. So I want to improve upon this. So this is where I adjust that nostril, adjust that shading. And I think that looks better. And then as I'm looking at this more, I thought it, it, it needed something even more to that. And so this is where I'm looking at the eye itself. And I'm thinking it's not bad but I don't think it's engaging enough. So I went back and I changed the eye. And as soon as I did this, it gave it the character it needed. And I think this looks so much better, looks so much more engaging. And now that we have our character established, we're going to go ahead and work out the typography that we're going to lock up with this character in certain iterations. So um, I just want to walk you through the typography exploration that I do when I'm working on something like this. And we're using a lot of traditional typefaces that, you know, are more collegiate like these up here. They're block, uh, uh, block letter forms. And those are okay. But there's a really good uh, type foundry called Type Drift, and it was started by a couple guys who are sports graphic designers, and they create really good typefaces. And the typeface I chose for this one is this one right here that I'm uh, kind of circling with my cursor. This is the one we want to use. But I wanted to customize it. And the name of this uh, typeface is called Champions. Uh, which is good. And you can see it's a great typeface, but for this specific iteration, I wanted the type uh, more condensed and they didn't have a version of this. This is the only version they had. So I modified all those letter forms and most of these, the F, O, R, D, and H were pretty easy because it's all 90 degrees. There weren't any angles in it. Those were easy to modify. But the A and the M is where it gets hard and I have to break it up into the same tolerance uh, but so I could modify the letter form. In this case, I would just take these shapes, unite them together, take this shape that uh, aligns with the baseline, select that and just trim it off like that. And then all we're going to do is if I zoom in on this, I want to match uh, the same rounding. So let's go ahead and match the fill. And then this is where I use a plugin. Once again, you can use the, um, uh, you can use uh, the corner widget, if you prefer. By the way, as I'm working, when I see an anchor and it's on a straight line like this, you can just go up and click this remove anchor. If it's on a curve, you're going to have to try doing it with the smart remove and use this tool instead. But I want to match all the curves we have in this. And that's why I use a plugin because I can hover over this. It says this is what this corner radius is. I click it and then I come over here and I apply it to these because I want those uh, to be the same. I can go down to here, hover over this one. It's that. Click it. That copies it. And then I can just apply it uh, to these corners down here like that. And so that's how I quickly... Uh, create a new form, in this case, a more condensed form. And if we compare the condensed with the original, this is what it looks like. So uh, that looks pretty good. Now, I also worked out or picked uh, Trey Gothic LT Extended as the typeface to be the secondary typeface for university uh, on this. And I think that's going to look really good as well. So let's go ahead and give our typography some uh, dimensionality to it. So I'm going to turn on this layer and all we're going to do is take this typeface. We're going to clone it, 
Command C, Command F. I'll pick a color we're not going to be using, which is this color, uh, just so we can see it. And on this, we're going to give this a seven point outline like that. And we'll turn on round. I'll copy it, select the type, paste behind. I'll select this again, make another copy of it. This is the black. We're going to add black outline. We're going to beef this up quite a bit to 22 points like that. We're going to go round and we're going to actually, we're not going to go round. We're going to keep that square and we're going to copy this, select our type, paste behind. Then we can take this interior one. This will be the school color. I'm going to copy it to the clipboard for a second. Select this, turn this white like that, and then paste our type back on it. And so this will be the base of our type. Um, I'm going to select everything but the red, and I'm going to go to path, and I'm going to go outline stroke. That way it's going to take the white and outline it. Now I'll unite it together like that. That looks fine. I'll take the outline one for the black and I'll unite those together like that as well. Now you may be thinking, well, these little pieces in between look weird and I agree they do. Uh, we're going to fix that, but I'm going to make a copy of our exterior one here. Oh, I just realized I goofed up. So no problem. I do that all the time in real life. So we're going to go back to this white and we're going to redo it because notice I have a curve on these ones. I don't want that. I want it to be straight. So we'll go ahead and make a copy of this. And just so we can see what we're doing, we'll go like that. And we're going to do seven again. We won't do, I had accidentally turned that on. We want to keep this straight like that. So let's go ahead and outline this stroke like that. That looks good. We'll copy it and I'll paste it behind original text. This is going to be white. Good. Now we'll take the outline stroke of black. I'll clone it. I'm going to bring it to the front. And just so you can see what I'm doing, I'm going to give it a blue outline, no fill like this. And all I'm going to do is I want to size this down. So I'm going to size it down. So this is right about right about there. I think that looks good. And then I'll bring this down to where I have that. So I'm positioning it to, in order to create dimension. Once I get it to this point, this is where I'll just grab my pin tool and wherever this is, then I'll match it to the corresponding so we'll just do this. We're creating shapes that will all fuse together. Now there's plugins out there that will automate this whole process, but I'm just showing you how to do it from scratch. So whether you have a plugin or not, uh, you'll be able to do it. So we'll do this one because that would go like that. This one doesn't matter. And we'll address these by using a plugin because those are tangents and you'd have to eyeball it uh, without a plugin. An illustrator like that. So we'll create that one. Uh, there might be enough here to do, yeah, just a little bit. We'll do that. And actually, I don't think we need that one up here. You're not going to notice that. Okay. Now, on the tangents, because if we wanted to get this, we're going to turn uh, Command-U back on. You'd have to eyeball it from here to like here and create something like this. But is that the exact tangent? Well, you don't know because Illustrator doesn't give you that information. So I use a plugin by uh, Stu Graphics called Subscribe, and it's called Tangent Line Tool. And I just start with one of the tangents, and then it'll automatically find the other one, switch to the Pin Tool, close out the shape. So now it's the exact tangent I need. I'll go to where we, uh, where we have another one, which would be right here. And this one's a, a little trickier, but we'll use that same plugin and I'll start here and I'll go up here. It'll find that tangent. Oops. Maybe we should zoom in. It'll be a little easier. We'll start with this one. So we'll find this tangent and we'll go here. I want it to go here. 
that works good. Let's make sure we sample that like that. And I'll just close <clears throat> this shape like that. We have a couple more to do. We have, we have a really kind of minimal one here, but we'll do it anyway. From here to here like that. And we'll close this shape. And then we got a couple on the M. This is the most obvious one like that. Again, Astute Graphics even has a plugin, but I didn't want to show that because most of you probably don't have Astute Graphics. So I just wanted to show you in general, um, even though in Illustrator, you would have to eyeball this. Oops. Like that. Um, this is how you can use a plugin. And you can do it in Illustrator natively. It's just might not be perfect. And that's the nice thing of having plugins. You can do it precisely. So I'm going to select everything, deselect the red, deselect the white. So it's just the black and the blue uh, together. And we'll go ahead and unite these. Oops, I guess I didn't get all these shapes. So let's select all these. Like that, and we'll unite those shapes. That looks good. Uh, we have a redundant point in there, so I always click this to get rid of redundant points. Now we'll fill it with the black color. It jumped to the front, so we'll copy it, select the letter forms, and paste behind. So now we have a really cool, uh, um, a really cool kind of dimensional aspect to the typography. Now, I would also uh, make a version of this that's distorted. And before I built everything you saw there, let's go ahead and just uh, select the white and the red. And I'll bring it down here like this. And then let's go ahead and uh, make a copy of this and go to black and then on the black we'll make it the 22 points and then we'll expand that and unite it copy it paste it behind if you wanted to create this distorted before you added that dimension you would work this out like this and then you could go to object, you could go envelope distort, uh, make with warp, and then you'd pick something like we'd do arch probably. And then this is way too much. So we would lower this to like 24 and then you would click okay. And then you'd wanna go expand. That would give you the raw vectors and then from this point, you could take, ungroup it, take the black, make a copy of it, Command C, Command F, or if you have the um, contextual taskbar open, just hit the duplicate. Then you can size it how much ever you want. In this case, maybe we go here. And we'll go ahead and color it a blue outline again, get rid of the fill. And then you could lower it like this and then build out the same dimension so you have one that's straight and you have one that's curved. So um, I had shown you how to do the, the curve thing in a previous movie where we did the um, another design with that kind of effect and we added actually added dimension. So I wanted to show you how you do I show you how to do it in general, and then if you want to do a curve, you could do that as well. And the curve one is actually uh, the one that I went with uh, because I want to lock it up uh, with the brand character here. And I think uh, this is really cool, like right now, but as I'm looking at the outline, I thought it was okay. I thought it was okay, but I thought we could uh, make it look better. This is about three-point outline here. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to add some beefiness to it. So we'll add a stroke to it. And on this stroke, I'm just going to add two. So we're going to use four because it'll eat on the inside too. And it'll eat on the outside too, like that. 
And then I could even just sample this to apply that to that. And I think that looks uh, a lot better in terms of uh, the thickness of the outline and weight of that. I think that's going to that's gonna look good. Now, of course, I would never leave this um, as an edible stroke. So I would take these and I would go to path and I'd go outline stroke much like I did on the dimensional type and I'd unite them together so they just become uh, vector shapes. And as I was setting up the final art, I wouldn't want these to be separate from like the outline on the type. So I'd fuse everything together. So what I end up with is a design that works on a one color, but it also works on a dark color like this. And I think that looks really cool. Um, you can use this on merchandise. So if you wanted to sell uh, merchandise to the student body, this could be the fleece, a hoodie fleece with this design on it. I think it looks great. Uh, but sometimes I like taking this and giving a lot of different options with their new branding because sometimes the it's inexpensive to do printing in one color. So I always like to give them a uh, full color design like this, but I also like to work it out in a one color format as well. Uh, so that's what I want to do here. I want to take this and we'll go ahead and ungroup it because this is just built the way I built it. And I'm going to take the black here and I'm going to go ahead on the type like this. And I want to go ahead and fuse uh, minus front like that. I think that looks good. Then I want to go ahead and take this outline that I have here. And this outline, I don't, oh, actually, we don't need the outline on this. So I'll delete it here, and I'll delete it here. This will become white like that. That looks good. And I think that looks uh, pretty good. We can get rid of the shading. I want to create a one color, so I'll get rid of the highlights here. We don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need the highlight in the eye. The horns the head, the eye, all of this will be white. So we'll go ahead, just so you can see what I'm doing, we'll color all of it. This gold color, we'll unite that together like that. Then I'll take the outline here along with the outline of the type and the type itself, and I'll fuse this all together like that. Then we'll take the black, take the black shape, I'll minus front out of that background shape, and then this will become white. And then I'll select all of it and I'll unite it together. So now we have a really great one color version of our design. And again, this would equally make a really cool merchandise as well. So I always try to be flexible in delivering final assets. So they have all kinds of possibilities of how they could use it. And it doesn't need to be expensive. That's the best part. Uh, once you create assets like this, there's a lot of different things they can do with it. Of course, they had an abbreviated design. So we took the design and we worked that out as well. This would work great for like an embroidery cap. So I mock that up how uh, that could be used. Of course, we develop a one color version and this one color version could be used to promote whatever sport uh, they wanted to. So if they have a football team, maybe they sell designs like this on garments uh, that people could buy to support and raise money for the football team. And in this case, we use that typeface uh, on that as is. We, did, we only uh, changed it to a condensed version for that one design I walk you through. Of course, this graphic of the RAM could be simplified onto the helmets like this. It looks awesome. And you can use it to uh, the one color format to support other sports. Maybe it's basketball. So you have a basketball version of the same design. You're just dropping in different name drops for basketball and iconography that represents that. And of course, this can be merchandised as well. They could sell uh, jerseys uh, in terms of raising money for their program. So a lot of things they could do with it. Now, the dimensional type I created uh, that's uh, straight 
could also be used to provide a horizontal version of their logo, both with and without the mascot worked into it. And of course, we had created a one color version so they could use it on merchandise like this, whether it's a tote bag, whether it's on a water bottle for the student body, just a lot more usability and great artwork is going to improve their marketing capabilities and help support the university the way a good brand identity should. Now, if we compare what they had in the past to what they could have now, uh, I think it's a, it's pretty safe to say what they could have now is very professional and it would represent them even better to the public at large and more importantly, in my opinion, to the student body. The student body would absolutely freak over this. They would love it. Uh, now, the brand flexibility I like to bring uh, to an entity like this is to provide that brand in such a way that they could use it in full color and print collateral. They could use it full color on garments, any kind of application, stickers, you name it. But that could also work on a dark colorized or photographic background. And if we simplify it into a one color version, then it makes usage even easier and less expensive in certain contexts like uh, garment impressions and printing in one color white instead of printing, uh, which would be in uh, four colors uh, for all their brand colors being worked into a design. Um, I like how this all came out now. And the hardest part for me will now begin, and that is pitching an entity who probably loves the current art they're now using. Uh, years ago, someone asked me, why are there so many bad logos? And I thought about that for a second and kind of uh, said in a sarcastic way, bad logos exist for the same reason mothers love their ugly children. Now, my friend looked at me in a confused way, then it sunk in and we both started laughing. So uh, just please don't be offended by that. That's just a joke, but there's a lot of truth and humor and that does have some truth into it. So do you know a business who could be a potential for a future brand salvage episode? Uh, if so, email me their information. That could be a URL uh, that points me to their website, et cetera. Let me know who you are. So if I decide to use you for a future episode, I can give you credit. And here's the deal I'm going to make for anybody who does that. If I pick your entity to feature in a brand savage and I pitch them and they go for it, I'll give you the same deal that I have with my art rep. And that is when he finds me work, he takes a 30% cut and I get 70. I would do the same thing for you. Whatever I end up billing that client, if they go for something, um, you're going to get 30% of it. So it, I think we could both benefit from that. So a huge thank you to my channel members, subscribers, those who give my videos a simple like, or those who share my videos and comment on them, because it all helps me grow this channel and covers my costs in producing new content. I really do appreciate it. Until next time, thank you for watching People of Process. And as always, I hope this content helps you improve your own creative process.